really good to see so many assembled here today. It's a beautiful morning. There's no place in the world that I would rather be, and I believe the same based on the singing and the voices and the kindness that have been expressed here today. We're thankful that you're here. We pray that you've been edified by worship up until this point, and I'm just thankful to Tony for his preaching this morning. That was so awesome and powerful and really well done. And You notice how it really affected the prayers that were offered at the table and how everything was moving towards victory and freedom and thankfulness to the Lord. That was so good. Thank you very much for that. Our hope is in Jesus. You used up the quota of amens for like the next three weeks, so that's fine. I don't need those. Um, But man, on point, very, very thankful. What a blessed time it is to be together and remember Jesus. If you got your Bibles and you'd be interested in following along today, we'll be moving around the New Testament a little bit, but James 2 is our starting point, so I encourage you to have your Bibles there in James 2. There are a couple of things about faith and belief that Scripture says very definitively. We are saved by our faith. We are saved through faith. We find eternal life through our belief in the Lord, by believing in God. The Bible says those things many times over, and by connecting the word faith to belief, that's not a big jump. Those are very similar uh, original words that relate to each other, but here's some verses you might know. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. In 1 John chapter 5, and verse 4, whoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. In Luke chapter 7, verse 50, and I don't have slides today, but I put these notes in the back. In Luke chapter 7, verse 50, Jesus has just forgiven the sins of a woman and says to her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. We are saved by our faith. That is three of many passages. John 3 and 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The Gospel of John says on many occasions that we have salvation via our belief. But the question isn't if that's true. It is true. The question is how is that true? What kind of faith and belief are we talking about? Because you and I have spent plenty of time in our lives in James chapter 2. And that's why I took your eyes there because that's where I knew your mind was already going. In James chapter 2, we're taught that there's a form of belief that does not save. The Bible says in verse 19, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. So whatever kind of belief that saves, whatever kind of faith saves, there is a hollowed out version of that that does not save. Because the demons who believe in Jesus as the Son of God, the demons are not saved. We also know that works and obedience are connected, best effort connected to salvation, because just two verses earlier than that, and really the whole context, Abraham and Rahab and the whole thing, even so faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. So this idea that I'm saved by faith and works aren't a part of it is not a Bible idea. But then comes the hard part. How do you figure all that out? How much of our faith is based on works? How many works are required to validate our faith? At what point is our trust not like the demon's trust? And what is the difference we want to know about those things? And so I want to talk about that with you in short order, I think, actually, today. Try to present simple, saving faith in a basic way that I hope connects to everyone. It's interesting, I was in here practicing this a few days ago, and it was dark in here, and I was, in, I was just practicing the intro you just heard, the, the Luke 7 read, John 3 read, and I went back to the back to think, okay, now, now what? You know, I know what I want to do, and I have this little calendar that Deck and Shannon gave me the other day. It's a little calendar on my desk, and it's Bob Goff quotes. Okay, it's just a guy I like to read, interesting guy, and I hadn't flipped over to the, to the new day yet, so I sat down and I was thinking through this idea of simple faith, and I flipped it and I read today's quote, and here was Bob Goff's quote that day. We don't need to make faith easier because it's not. We need to make it simpler because it is. Okay. I get it. I'm, I think I'm on the right track. You know, I went back and sat down thinking about those exact things, and then that's the thing that we read, and that's what I want you to get. There is nothing about our next few minutes together that is going to make faith necessarily easy. It's not designed to be easily easy. It's designed to be immersive. 
It's designed to be controlling in its, in its force in the way that you live for God. It's not easy. I think we can make it a little bit easier by understanding how it works, but it is definitely simple. It's not complicated and hard and we don't have to fight about it. Listen carefully. I want to make a statement to you and then I want to use some time working on it. Would you back up in your Bibles to Hebrews 11, please? Hebrews chapter 11. Here is the statement of simplicity that I would like to present this morning. Saving faith. Saving faith is living like you see it. Living like you see him. Living like you are there with him even before you are. That's the claim today. I'll read it more quickly one more time. Saving faith is living like you see it, living like you see him, living like he is right there beside you even before you are in those places. It makes me think about the demons. When the demons were not in the presence of Jesus, I doubt they were going around saying, we fear him and he is awesome and he is the living God. I doubt they were living like that. But when they were face to face with him, when they actually experienced his power right now, they're super humble. Now they're going, oh, you're the living God and please throw us into these pigs and don't cast us out. But it didn't require faith then. They didn't need faith. They were looking at him and they were subject to him. The problem is when the demons weren't in his presence, when they weren't having to face the majesty of his power, that held no substance for them. That's the idea of faith in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 is about conviction, reality, and the dominance of Jesus without seeing his face or being subject to his immediate action. Let me show you what I mean. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Faith. What is faith? How do you define it? Saving faith. It is the assurance, this version says, New American Standard, the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. I am living in assurance and conviction. I am sure of who I am and why I'm here, and I am convicted about what is coming and what is real, and yet I cannot yet see it. I'm not yet exposed to it, but I am living as if I was. That's simple saving faith. He goes on to say, you know, look, this is how the men of old gained approval. They hadn't yet seen God. They hadn't yet seen heaven. They just lived like they had. By faith, verse 3, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. It's this understanding that God creates and destroys everything, even without me having to see him destroy everything. Verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to please him. What do you mean? What is this faith? Because he who comes to God must believe that he is. You haven't seen him yet, but you believe as if you have and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. I have not yet received the reward, but I'm living as if it is the realest thing in my life. And I submit to you that if the reward was right in front of us everywhere that we went, we would behave very, very well. But there wouldn't be any faith required because we would be seeing it. Verse 13, after he talked a little bit about Noah and Abraham and Sarah, and he has some others he talks about. But in verse 13, he says, all these died in faith without receiving the promises. Okay? They didn't get to see the, the reality of it, but they believed in the reality of it. But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Well, did they see it or not? Did they see heaven during their life? Did they see God's face? Because it says that they had not received the promises, verse 13. And then it says they saw him. Which one is it? It's faith. Faith is living like you're seeing it, even if you have not yet seen it. Let me give you a couple of examples today. That's why I didn't give you slides. I want to give you a couple of pieces of imagery. The first one is a piecing together that is not based in reality, but it's designed to get you thinking. And the second one will have a little bit more reality to it. I want you to imagine something for just a moment. Just go with me on this for a moment. We get done with church today, you go eat, you do whatever, and you and whoever you're with, your family, you just head home. You head home for the afternoon, and you and all of your family are in that home, and Jesus comes to your house. He literally actually returns and walks into your house and he shows himself to be Jesus and there's no doubt in your mind that it is Jesus. You and your family are looking at Jesus and he says, listen up because I have a question for you. He says, first, I want you to look to my left. He's in your house. He says, look to my left and he opens up a portal to hell. You see it. 
You see hell. You feel the warmth emanating out of this portal into your living room. You smell it, that sulfury, awful, unmistakable smell. It is visible to you and to your senses. You see the devil thrown into that fire and you hear him screaming as he is immersed in flame. You actually see people, Revelation 21, 8, those who are liars and abominable, and you see that they actually do go there. It's not just an idea. You watch them go into the flame and Jesus says, look at that. Then he says, I want you to look to my right. And so you turn your gaze away from hell. And he opens up a portal to heaven. And it's Revelation 21, 22. You see this beautiful place and the angels. You get to see this glorious environment in these streets of gold. And there's this tree that sort of branches out on both sides. And the river of life runs underneath that tree. And it comes out of the throne room of God. And there is God sitting on his throne. And there is no death, no sickness, no sorrow. He says, look at it. You don't have to imagine it. You're looking at it. And then he comes back to you and he says, here's my deal. You ready? You have two choices. One choice is you can leave all of this behind. You got to walk away from your life. You got to leave it all behind. Leave it all behind and let's you and your family, let's just go to heaven right now. Now, some of you are like, let's get out of here. Because, you know, it means leaving your house and your car and your spring break plans. But I think you'd be like, okay. But some of it's a little bit more difficult. I would have to look at my wife Summer and go, I'm not going to be your husband anymore. And you're not going to be my wife. And these aren't going to be my kids. And I'm not going to get to see my grandkids. Like, it's a big deal. But I think we would look at each other and go, that matters more than this. Let's get out of here. I think we would say that. But he'll double down. And Jesus goes, uh, here are the rest of this. You can leave all of this and let's get out of here. Or you can stay. And you can have all that. And you can do all that. And you can buy all that. And you can raise all that. But in the end, because you chose this over that, this door closes. And after this life is over, that's where you're going. What are you going to do? Let's be real. Is there anybody in this room who would not leave with Jesus with their family on the spot? Now, that is not an accurate telling of the judgment scene, which I'll talk more, talk more about in a minute. But it is a pretty easy choice. But do you know why it was easy? Because that choice requires zero faith. There is no faith in that decision. You're not having to believe in something that you haven't seen like the judgment day. You're looking at it. You don't have to imagine the kind of choices that you need to make and what they mean and what direction. You are looking at Jesus face to face and making those decisions. It would be easy. You know what faith is? It's pretty simple. Faith is making those same kinds of decisions today that you would make if Jesus was standing in your living room with two open portals. That's what faith is. Those decisions I'm going to make now. I'm going to choose what is heavenly, what is holy, what is godly over even my own family's desires because I believe that that is real. It reminds me of some of the things Jesus wrote. Go to Matthew in the 16th chapter. In Matthew chapter 16, listen to the language of Jesus. He's teaching it by faith. He's saying, this is the way you live your life before we get there because you and I both know that when we get there, he's not going to make you a deal. When he does finally appear and you see heaven and you see hell and all this is gone, the choices will have already been made. By faith, they will have already been made or not made. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24, Jesus said to his disciples, we read this verse a lot, but we're going to read a little bit more. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. If Jesus is in your living room and there's hell over there and heaven over there and he says, let's go, you would go. But that wouldn't require faith. Faith is getting up tomorrow morning before you see him and denying yourself and taking up your cross and following him. He says, whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? That's an interesting question. On the last day in the judgment scene where there's not a lick of faith on the planet. Because faith is conviction in what you haven't yet seen. Faith is belief in what you have not yet experienced. There's not going to be any faith in that way on the day of judgment because it's all going to be real right there. Everybody's going to be a believer because it's going to be there. In that final day, how many do you think would give up every single thing they have in the whole wide world just so their soul would be saved? How many? 
What percent? 100%. Every atheist and agnostic you know, one day, when they are facing Jesus, would say, I'll give it all up. I'll delete all my social media posts. I'll fix everything to go. But the problem is, it won't require any faith to make that choice. Today, you make it by faith. That's how faith works. He goes on to say, look, what would a man give in exchange for his soul? That's a, that's a today question. That's not a final judgment question. For the Son of Man is, though, going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, Matthew 16, 27, and will then repay every man according to his deeds. Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death. And he talks about the establishment of his kingdom, the kingdom that he established of which we are now a part. And that's really kind of cool. I won't get off on this too far, but, you know, we're in the kingdom of the Lord today, but we haven't yet seen a lot about that. We haven't yet seen the king sitting on his throne. We've not yet seen who are all of those who are in the kingdom. One day he will transfer that kingdom to the Father and there will be, we talk about faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love because once we get to heaven and we're like in the literal heavenly abode, you won't need to trust in it. You'll be experiencing it. But today you're in it here, okay? You're in it. You're under the leadership of the king. You're associated with fellow citizens. You're under his government. But today you do it by faith. And that's how he determines who will be there in the end. He will repay those in the end. This made me think of some practical things. Let me give you a couple. You're like, how does this look and feel practically? I I hope I'm being really, really simple and straightforward. Whatever you would say to Jesus in your living room, just say to Jesus every day. Whatever you would pick, if it meant eternity, pick, because it means eternity by faith. But I thought of a couple of examples. Look at Matthew 5. We could do really a whole bunch of these, but look at Matthew chapter 5 for just a moment. I thought about the idea of lust and sinfulness and these kinds of things, and we'll use two examples. Matthew 5, 27 and 28. You heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye makes you stumble, you tear it out and throw it from you. It's better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. So he's bringing hell into it. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It's better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. So we know this. I don't need to preach the whole context. I'm just giving you an example. We know that lust and fornication... And adultery and pornography and all suggestive relationships. that are, We know all of that is wrong. And Jesus is saying, you do whatever in the world you need to do not to do that. You cut off whatever you need to. You throw out whatever you need to. You make sure you don't do that. And some of us battle those things. But let me ask you, if it was the judgment, if today he was in your living room, And he was looking at you and like your face was starting to burn from the fire of hell coming out of the portal. He's like, could you shrink that portal a little bit? And this portal, and he's looking at you and he's like, will you give up lust and immorality and let's get out of here? Who would say no? We would all be like, yes, I will. Well, are you willing to confess some of what you have done and hidden? Yes. I, if it means I get to go there and not there, I will confess everything I've ever done. I'll tell you everything I've been doing. I'll, t- I'll confess it all. But here's the thing. There won't be any faith required then. And that's why it won't save you. Everybody's going to be confessing like crazy on that last day. And it won't save them because faith is gone. You know what faith is? Faith is rejecting immorality and confessing it now because that moment is so real to you in the way that it's actually going to happen. It moves on to other things as well. I was thinking about verse 38. This is as hard or harder, maybe. You have heard it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat. Whoever forces you to go one mile, say, hey, can I go another one for you? Give to him who asks of you. Do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you to love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you because God loves them. Look, is that hard? That's really hard. We negotiate that verse a little bit and go, well, what it actually means is, you know, it doesn't mean you actually have to give it to them. It just means, you know, better to do that than carry personal vengeance. I think there's some truth to the nuance of that. But I got to tell you, if he was in my living room with two portals open and he was like, forgive your enemy and give them everything, you know what I would give them? Everything. I'd be like, they can have it. That means nothing. This means everything. I'd give it all up. Well, are you willing to forgive this guy? Forgiven. Done. 
I just want to go there. But there won't be any faith. Only fear. You see that? I'll be acting purely in fear without faith. Perfect faith and love cast out fear. Because I make those decisions based on how to treat my enemy right and how to forgive and how to love before we get there. And that's the difference between the saved and the lost. The lost are going to forgive everybody when it's too late to do anything. The lost are going to forfeit all of it when none of it has any more value. Faith does so today. While it still is very hard to do. It's not easy. It's simple. And while there may be some cost to it. So those are some examples that came. Now, I thought about today, you know, a slide going, here's how you're going, okay, got it, Chris, but how do I develop that? Well, to me, the imagery is powerful enough. I just have to bring him into everything that I'm doing, which I'll finish with in a moment. But obviously, we could make a list. We could talk about the way you read the Bible. You're trying to understand the reality of the Lord. The way you read about his nearness and his presence. The Lord is near, the Bible says in Philippians 4. The Lord is with you always, Matthew 28. You can pray in a way that says he's here and he's close. There's lots of things. I'm not going to go through it. There's lots of things you can do. Today, I just want you to understand the simplicity of it. It's not just belief. It is belief in his promises and his return and in the reality of his presence. Let me give you a second and final scenario. Every day we face temptations. Go to Galatians 5 a minute. I'm just going to give you a list. Uh, I thought about Ella, Ella's class. They're memorizing the list in Galatians 5. Is anybody in uh, Ella's fourth and fifth grade? Fourth and fifth grade? So she, she said, this year we're memorizing the list in Galatians 5. And I'm like, that's so great. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. And I'm like, go ahead, Ella, recite it for us. And she goes, now the deeds of the flesh are evident. Which are immorality, this is, this is the quote on the way to church on Sunday mornings. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, things like these of which I forewarned you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You don't just turn around and go, way to go, Elle. That's sweet. Like, she's learning something very powerful. She already knows. They have already recited the deeds of the of, the, of the, the, the fruit of spirit. So what she's learning is life has this set of choices to it. And every day you can choose love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, faithfulness, self-control, or you can choose to be immoral. First three things, immorality, impurity, sensuality. You can choose to put other things before God, idolatry and sorcery. You can choose to be mad and mean to everybody, enmity, strife, jealousy. You can choose to compromise yourself, drunkenness and crazy. You can choose all that. Those things are there every day. So here's my scenario for you. Every day you face some derivative of those two lists. Sometimes it's choosing sin. Like you're tempted to choose pornography or you're tempted to choose bitterness. You're tempted to choose to lie. There's this wrong thing and the devil's going, this is a good chance for you to get out of trouble. And so here's the thing. So every day you're having to make that choice. Sometimes it's about choosing the good things. It's not always that. Sometimes the choices we make every day are the good things. Like, am I willing to forgive this person? Well, my family and I get in the car and choose to go to worship instead of other things. I see someone who is destitute and poor, and I've got plenty and they've got none. Maybe I should stop and try to help them. There seemed like there was a parable or something about that once. Maybe, like, those are the choices you face every day. I don't always get those right. How about you? Anybody here get that right? If saving faith is always getting those decisions right, then none of us are saved. But that's why we get to keep coming back to the Lord and ask for help. But let me ask you this. What if, here's my last what if, second one. What if every single time you face one of those decisions, it may be the sin side drawing you, it may be the righteous side, every single time you faced one of those choices, Jesus appeared. He absolutely, literally appeared on your right and he put his hand on your shoulder and he said, I am here with you. Can you imagine it? I love you. I gave everything for you because I believe in you. And this decision right here, this poor person here needs some help or this website that's drawing your attention, you go where you, you see this. This is our moment. This is the moment where all that has been invested in you and what I hope for you, this is the faith without works is dead. This is the moment that that faith takes life. And I want you to make the choice right here that best reflects how much you love me. 
I think I could already ask you my follow-up question, but I'll add an extra dimension. Maybe the devil shows up too, like on the two shoulders, except he can't even be in the room with the light of Christ. He's hiding over there behind the table, whimpering and scared, going, don't listen to him, do whatever you want. Like, if that's what happened to you every time, like, would you ever sin? I've been thinking this through. How often do you think you'd make the right decision? Jesus' hand is on your shoulder. He's talking you through it. He's telling, like, I kind of think I would do what was right maybe every time, maybe. But there's a problem with that. There's a reality to that, by the way. Jesus is always in the room. And he does love you. And he is pulling for you. And opportunities are created. And the devil is a whimpering loser over here trying to make other losers. But the difference is in the scenario I gave you, how much faith is required to make the right decision? None. There's no faith. His hand is on my shoulder. There's no faith. I don't have to go, man, this is a tough one. <laughs> What's Jesus going to think? He's looking at me. Here's what simple faith is. It's easy. Well, maybe not easy. Here's what simple faith does. Simple faith makes that decision as if I am seeing him. Because he is with me and I believe in him. That's the idea. I want to give you one final text for this. Go to 2 Corinthians. Beautifully explained to us in 2 Corinthians. Chapter 4 and chapter 5. Let's read a little bit together, do a little bit of contextual work. Look in chapter 4. We go through life. Life gets difficult. Things happen. He goes on to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, you know, some of the temptations we fight are just discouragement and sadness and sorrow. But though our outer man is decaying, our inner man is being renewed day by day. For a momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look, look at verse 18, not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are seen are not seen are eternal. How do I look at unseen things? Think about that. Look at verse 18. He goes, here's how we do it. Here's how we make the right choices. Here's how we deal with sickness. Here's how we deal with sorrow. Here's how we deal with ill treatment. Here's how we make the right decision. We look at things we cannot see. Huh? You know, there's a word for that. You know what it is? Faith. Faith is looking at the presence of Jesus, though I have not seen Jesus. It is looking at heaven through that portal, though I have not yet seen it. And it's going, those things are so real, it's as if I can see them with my own eyes, and it'll change every decision that you make, even dealing with sorrow and hurt. He goes on to say, we know that this earthly tent, which is our house, is going to be torn down. We know we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. While we're in this house, we groan, we long to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as having put it on, we'll not be found naked. So he's kind of contrasting life here with life there. For indeed, while we're in this tent, we groan being burdened. We don't want to be unclothed. We want to be clothed. There, mortality will be swallowed up by life. Now, he who has prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave to us the Spirit as a pledge. So I want to get to the, the verses that I want you to take home and, and read for yourself, which are coming up. But I want you to see what he's saying. He's saying, look, I know it's hard here. The sin choices are hard, the sacrifice choices are hard, and the sorrow choices. Are. Somebody write that down. That's a three-point sermon. I just, I just uh, alliterations just get us out of bed in the morning, preachers. You got sin problems, you got the second thing I already forgot, and you got sorrow problems. You have to cast your eyes to heaven and you have to see it. You have to cast your eyes to Jesus and you have to see him. You have to see the promises and what the Holy Spirit, because he's brought up here as well, has shown us, and they have to be real to you. And you make decisions like you're there even before you get there, and you'll be fine. You'll be fine, and life will be exactly what it's supposed to be, a challenge, but it will not hold a candle to the reward for those who are faithful. Let me finish with this. Verse 6, here's what we do. Therefore, because we believe all that, therefore, being always of good courage, and knowing that while we are in home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. Now, here, here it is. We walk by faith, not by sight. Anybody can walk by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and we have a preference. We prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. That's that early scenario I gave you. I'll give all this up to be there. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that everyone may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, 
whether good or bad. It's a beautiful text. I would encourage, of all the things we've read today, I would encourage you to read verses 6 through 10, maybe get up each morning this week. I mean, I encourage you to back up to 4.16, read the whole thing. But definitely read verses 6 through 10. We are a people of good courage. You say, where's your courage coming from? Expectation. A spiritual reality I have not yet seen. My courage comes from faith. Because I am walking by that which I have not yet seen, but it is if, as if I have. And so I have good courage, and I know where I want to be. I want to be in heaven more than I want to be here. Boy, that might split a church down the middle right there. You want to be in heaven more than you want to be here? You want to be here more than you want to be there? I know what decision you're going to make when you're faced with the two of them. By faith, we're supposed to be making that decision every day. So what do we do? How does faith work? Well, every day, whether we're here or there, we seek to be pleasing to him. Now look at verse 9. How many of you guys, all right, hard question, you ready? Toughest one you're going to get today. He said verse 9, whether at home or absent. At home or absent or at home or absent. What? He means here or there. My question is this. When you're in heaven, do you think you will do the things that are pleasing to the Lord? Did you think about that? You think you'll get up every day and go, how do I... Thank God for all of this. I think everybody will. He said, here's what faith does, though. Faith acts that way. Faith lives like that whether you're at home or absent. It doesn't matter where you are, earth or heaven. It's the same. That's how faith works. We will appear before him. That's kind of the interesting part of this. So let me give you two takeaways, two little takeaways. Number one, people sometimes talk about being saved by faith alone. You are saved by faith alone. But if that idea, and oftentimes it is, is the idea that it's belief separated from obedience, I want you to understand how ludicrous that idea is. That I'm saved by faith alone and I believe in him and I love him and I'm not living for him or obeying him or giving my life to him. My question to those people would be, if Jesus was standing right in front of you, would you give your life to him? If you were literally looking at him or his hand was on your shoulder, because that's what faith does. The idea that faith is separated from obedience is idiocy. It's, it's insane. You know, we don't talk about faith that saves. Faith that saves transforms your life because you are living without seeing him exactly how you would live if you did. That's it. You live as if you see him even before you do. Because second and final observation, one day you will. 2 Corinthians 5.10. One day there'll be no faith needed. Every knee will bow, Revelation 1. Everyone will see him. Everyone will believe in his existence. They'll be like the demons, though. They'll be like the demons, who once the demons saw him, and what was he going to say? What was the demon going to say? You are the most high God, and please take care of us. Like, it didn't require any faith to say that. That's what everybody's going to be doing. Everybody's going to want to be saved by him. Everybody's going to be wanting to give anything up. They'll pay every dollar they've got, but it won't be by faith. It'll be purely by fear, and it'll be totally too late. His, pay, his people are saved by faith, and faith means when you see him, you will be faithful to him, but faith also means that you will seek to replicate that same faith even before you do. That's what today is, by the way. Welcome to today. Today is you have not yet seen him. How will you live? He has not yet placed his hand upon your shoulder, but he is here. What will you do? How much do you live in hope of what is coming? How real is it when it comes to your decisions? If we can help you make the right decision, please don't wait. Please don't wait until faith won't save because faith won't be an option. Be saved by faith today. Respond today. He is with us. You will see him. Let us live like we believe it as we stand together and sing.